Hello, everybody. I'm really glad to be back at CCTV and here with Melody Joy, the author of Shaktified, which is your first book. Yes. Yeah, first book, just recently out. And um, Melody and I met in Huntington. We both live there, at least part time, and connected through a shared love of yoga. And I wanted to spend more time with you and share the wisdom of your book after I read it. And um, so we're going to talk through a little bit about Melody's life and book and her journey. And a little bit more background, Melody has worked at the intersection of Eastern and Western healing practice for nearly two decades, focusing on women's health and empowerment. And she brings a unique blend of professional understanding and spiritual insight to her transformative work with trauma, ancestry, and healing. She has worked as a diagnostic medical sonographer at med multiple medical facilities nationwide and holds certifications in various alternative healing modalities, including Hatha and Tantric Yoga, Reiki, energy medicine, massage therapy, and spiritual coaching. And a little bit more about Melody is with a deep rooted passion for holistic healing and the world of spirit, Melody is committed to unlocking the full human potential of those she works with. She has inspired countless individuals, including myself, mm. in my living room, <laughs> <laughs> privately and in group settings by supporting them in embracing their inner strength, overcoming personal challenges, and leading lives of authenticity and joy. Uh, you can read more and work with Melody at MelodyMysticJoy.com and by reading her book. So I want to begin with who you are and where you grew up and then we can kind of jump into, into the book. Great. Uh, I am a native Vermonter, <laughs> so I grew up in southern Vermont in a little town called East Dorset, and I grew up in an old house. I call it the, the House of Spirits because <laughs> it was originally the general store, and then it turned into a library, and it was a house on the corner right next to the railroad tracks, and so it had, it had a life of its own, and uh, my family moved there when I was born. My, my mother and father are both from Philadelphia, and then myself and my three other siblings were all born um, in Bennington, and I grew up in southern Vermont outside of Manchester. Mm. Yeah, I grew up in Huntington, so shared, shared background in Vermont, too. And uh, we've talked a little bit about your family history and upbringing, and um, I'm curious, growing up in small town Vermont, what inspired you to, to try something new? Um, when you say try something new, what do you mean? <laughs> Leave Vermont. <laughs> How did you get out of Vermont? <laughs> I, um, I think I've always had a little bit of travel lust, um, and I've always been curious about the world and other people and other cultures, and I think that that, uh, called me outside of Vermont. And, and I also felt as a BIPOC person, um, I wanted to see more of the world than just what I experienced in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, um, and we have this first question. This, this book is really about your own story of healing and transformation, and it's a testament to the potential power that, that all people have, mm -hmm. but it's really focused around your personal journey. And I, yeah, it sounds like the beginning of your journey has started in Vermont and wanting to grow and see other places. And yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the impetus for this book? Yes, um, I would say that it originally occurred when I was born, <laughs> when I was this galactic cosmic energy put in a tiny little human body. <laughs> I feel like that was an initiation. And, and I, think that's, I think that's the initiation we all get as humans is that we, we do come from spirit, we do come from uh, multi-dimensional existence, and it becomes limited when we're in human form. So I would say that was kind of the big meta mm -hmm. feel for it. 
but the constellation of my family, of my father being black and my mother being white in a predominantly white area was uh, what initiated a sense of not belonging. Mm. And I'm not unique th to that feeling. I think everyone has an experience of, of not belonging. And I, I really came to write this book during COVID in 2020 when I was working as a healthcare professional um, during, I think it was the Delta variant at that time. And I had lived in Charleston before, but I was there and I was working at a hospital that was a predominantly black hospital and a lot of things came to light for me mm -hmm. and that was that many of the patients had the last names of plantation owners several generations down and Charleston South Carolina is a gorgeous place but it has a very dark history and that history is that 50 percent of the transatlantic slave trade um, took place through the port of Charleston. So I started to connect to my own wounding mm -hmm. around my ancestry on my father's side. And it was something that I had, I had explored before and felt that I healed, but it came up at a whole nother level. And I think that's with any healing or transformation, we interface with what we're available for, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some of those deeper aspects of ancestry definitely came up then in 2020. But um, my father was a spiritual man. My childhood was very um, vibrant in that my father was selling psychedelic mushrooms and marijuana, and that was his life. He was a 70-year-old black man big gray afro, no teeth, and he had had a spiritual experience in prison. He, grew, he was born in 1908, so he was stealing from the mafia and that lent, you know, landed him in prison several times. And he had this, this kind of revelation experience that connected him with spirit. So growing up, it was like a psychedelic church almost at my house <laughs> where people would come and hang out with my dad and and talk about spiritual things and 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 have psychedelic experiences and that also impacted my own life mm -hmm. um, you know so it was a blend of a lot of things and some of those things resonated with me and some of those things because I also have a history of physical abuse were things that pushed me away from spirituality as far as my family of origin and, and how I connected to it and so when I came um, you know kind of later in my life to things like yoga and meditation I also uh, walked kind of the path of macrobiotics for a while and finding spirituality through food and relationship with food, um, that I, I started to have my own path mm -hmm. to spirituality and, um, and, and then had a, an awakening in 2014 that transformed everything I thought about spirituality. It gave me a direct experience of it. And a lot of that direct experience was a shedding process. And that shedding process was um, confronting trauma and ancestry and all of the wounding there. And then that was 2020 when I decided I would write a book about that experience because I think that we need each other's stories. We need to hear like the different places we've come from and how we've moved uh, beyond that and how we're still with things that block us and hold us back and, and, and more than anything, I think the world of spirit and the world of our physical embodiment is about connecting to our heart mm. and remembering our, our collective human connection. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's where we're at now. And I also feel that COVID was kind of the initiation globally for everyone to be on the same level of sickness and fear and lack to kind of come face to face with all of those hidden shadows that we all have. And they're different. I think, feel like everybody, everybody has a little flavor of drama <laughs> and it's, it's different than, you know, from one person to the next. But, but we're living in an age of evolution and it's, and it's happening very quick. And I wrote this book because I wanted to share my experience for anyone else who feels like they might be going crazy in the times that we live in and to let them know it's okay. It's, it's, it's all part of the medicine. Yeah, I really appreci that, I appreciate that you're, you're drawing from being born to this 70-year-old father, a little bit older, black man growing up in pretty white Vermont, 
and noticing the the need to leave and find and understand new ways of being that leads you to Charleston, which really forces you to confront uh, your ancestral wounding in a really big way. And, and then this leads you to this expansive awakening. And could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think we hear this word like awakening and maybe mm. like lots of people on their spiritual journey are seeking this, what is awakening? Mm -hmm. What is like freedom or liberation? Um, so what does that mean for you? What was that experience like for you? Um, I think that everyone has Buddha nature <laughs> or Christ nature or this this oneness part of consciousness and it's the same for everyone and it's a matter of dialing into it but most of my focus with awakening has been through the body because that I think has been the place that there is the least amount of talk and expression and exploration mm. when connecting to spirit or awakening and um, that Buddha nature in the body is called Shakti. Mm. And so everyone has masculine and feminine polarity, and that awakening is actually Shakti, which is a Hindu goddess and is depicted as two coiled snakes at the base of the spine, that when she awakens, those two snakes, like the medical caduceus, mm -hmm. start to make their way up to the crown of the head. And that's where the Buddha nature or Christ consciousness is or that oneness or samadhi, that feeling that we are a part of all of everything in existence. When that part in our body, that chakti meets that unified consciousness, then we open up to our true nature. And that's a little bit different for everybody. But that awakening, at least my experience, is the technology that lies dormant in all bodies the practice of yoga is, is a way that most people can relate to that awakening energy. Yoga means union, and it is union of body and, 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 and spirit, of, of mind. But the last thousands of years have been focused through the intellect, through the mind. How do we awaken through these different you know, practices that are you know, very linear mm -hmm. and they're super valuable and, and very valid, but we're moving in a, t in a time that with every evolutionary switch, there's a, a swing of the pendulum from one side to the next. Mm -hmm. And so we're moving kind of back into that feminine so that we're ultimately back in harmony with both m matter and divine. Mm. There's so, so many good points that I want to ask about with what you just said. And I, I, I really, reading this, you weave myth and yoga in a really beautiful way. And I want to talk about your yogic journey a little bit. But I also want to read um, this quote. You quote Campbell, who um, you write about the myth of Adam, Eve, and Lilith. Mm -hmm. Um, myth is a manifestation in symbolic images, in metaphorical images of the energies of the organs of the body in conflict with each other. And you spoke a little bit to how you use myth and, and stories and yoga. Um, but can you talk a little bit about this Adam and Eve and Lilith story? Because I, I'd never heard of Lilith. You know, of course, I've heard about Adam and Eve and sin, but I hadn't known about who Lilith, Lilith was in relationship to this feminine or Shakti energy? Um, yes. So I would say, the so we all have archetypal forces. Everybody can connect to archetypal forces. And I love uh, the, the myths that, and the stories that surround these archetypal forces because forces, we can all identify in yeah. some way. And, and for Lilith, before I get into who she was and how she's described, her main wounding is rejection and abandonment. Mm. You know, and back to that first initiation of being human, if, if you can remember your cosmic, <laughs> delicious, you know, expansive state, and then you come into this little 
you know, human body, it can feel like betrayal. It can mm -hmm. feel like abandonment. It can feel like rejection. And that f sense of separation continues to get impacted with each experience we have. It can be race or gender mm -hmm. or sexual preference, socioeconomic status. There's a, a myriad of ways that we can experience that. And for Lilith, she is the original, the original woman. So in the Bible, it says, God created um, man and woman. So these two polarities of energy and this idea of Eve is actually something that came out of the masculine principle, the idea of woman, mm. you know, well behaved, born of the man, born of the mind. But Lilith is, Lilith is the pure, chaotic polarity of feminine energy. It's pure chaos. Whereas like the masculine, pure masculine, it, the masculine moves in a way that it eliminates to create or to manifest. By taking away, you create. Just like an architect has certain measurements to create a structure. You can't create it out of chaos. That's why we need both together. Mm. But um, Lilith, she was originally the, the, the woman um, counterpart to the masculine Adam and she was chaotic and wild and wanted to have sexes on top and lead <laughs> and and not be denied anything and that's we all have that part of us that doesn't want to be denied anything and it's it's childlike and also very beautiful too mm -hmm. and in that repressing or denying the, that chaotic part of ourselves we come into harmony at some point but if it goes too far then we exclude it or kick it out. And so Lilith was kicked out of the Garden of Eden um, when Adam said, I'm, I need a counterpart that's equal to me, thinking that Lilith was not. And so Eve is born. Mm. Um, so you have these two uh, ideas of the feminine, the feminine that's controlled and, con and constricted through the minds, and then the pure chaotic force. But it doesn't need to be tempered. Lilith is an aspect of us that will naturally find its temperance in our desire to, to express. So it's creative in, in, in the chakra system or in the energetic dimensions in the body, she is connected to the second chakra, which is emotions and water. It's really the pure feminine and, and we've, and we're dry. We have been disconnected to our emotions and we were like, oh, we're going to compartmentalize that or just put that away all together. Yeah. And so there are all these shadows connected to the mm. second chakra around sexuality. You can see this, you can see this in things like, um, it, child porn and child trafficking and, and many other ways that sexual expression hasn't had its full cr creative expression. So it's been forced to kind of find these darker ways mm. to express. But when expressed fully, our sexuality, when talked about and shared and honored, it becomes something very beautiful and very powerful. Mm. And part of you know the patriarchal arc of Judeo-Christianity is to repress those parts of feminine sexuality or sexuality um, altogether in, in order to control. Because mm. um, I, I believe that there was a time where the feminine was the powerful dominating force and then it shifted and then it was patriarchal, it was, it was masculine. And it's not one is better than the other, it's just, back to that natural swing of the pendulum or this you know, evolution of humanity. And we're moving into this time where when you can tap into your sexuality and there's no shame or guilt or trauma or wounding mm -hmm. and you can fully express it, then that's your compass. That's your emotional compass and it's your creative compass. And, and when we can kind of hone the energy that's available there, Life just becomes art. Life <laughs> becomes play. Life becomes delicious. And, you know, Joseph Campbell also said that, you know, every feeling fully felt is bliss. So that also means that grief, mm. you know, and, and anger, all of the emotions that have been pathologized, especially in Western civilizations, mm -hmm. when we can tap into that, mm -hmm. then we start to tap into that bliss, that this is part of it. And that 
underneath that bliss is deep compassion yeah. for our own humanness, but also the humanness of others. And that begins the return to the garden mm -hmm. for Lilith and for ourselves. And, and it's regardless of gender. It's, it's not about that. Although there are some ways that gender plays out with the myth. Yeah. Wow. So, so much goodness in there. And I want to read this quote that you included about the repression of the feminine and Shakti energy in this powerful force and creative force. The narrative got internalized throughout time. The narrative that got internalized throughout time is that women cannot be holy, let alone intermediaries to connect with the divine. And you, we hear about a little bit about Lilith, but we also hear about the story of Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really powerful story. Um, and maybe you can share a little bit about her as well, um, because I, I want to bring up all those kind of the symbols of feminine power. Um, okay, so I want to just talk about a little bit of a bridge, because yeah. when I wrote the book, I scaffolded it through the chakras. Yeah. And Lilith is down here at the, the lower part of the chakras, which has a lot of shadow. Mm. And Mary Magdalene is connected to the third eye and sacred sight. So the bridge is really to come, yeah. you know, through the heart to touch the wisdom that, you know, Mary Magdalene shares with us. And, and that is this... When our hearts are open, we're like children. You know, uh, children will play and they're just like gush yeah. with excitement <laughs> or anger. Yeah. All of that is being connected to the heart, being connected to their, how they're feeling impacted by the environment. And mm -hmm. there's not a, a lot of filters. So a lot of people have filters. And when the energy moves up and we connect to the, to the heart, all of a sudden prayer becomes ecstatic. Prayer becomes uh, a way that we're not sitting in pews on our hands and knees, <laughs> begging, begging to be atoned for this deep sense of sinfulness uh, or that, you know, we need to be punished. It, 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 um, it, be it becomes, again, that life is art and creative expression and um, can, can move up through the higher chakras, which are much more social. And Mary Magdalene is connected to the, th the third eye or Ajna, which is associated with sacred sight. And so it's bringing the hemispheres of the mind together. So we can see through um, the lens of the masculine and the, the lens of the feminine. And more, more of our feminine polarity is intuition being able to see beyond uh, the veil or being able to see the unseen. And just like children can see people and things and magical places and universe, it's because that intuitive feminine aspect of the third eye is open. Mm -hmm. But when you deny and repress, oh, that's not real. Mm -hmm. that, that friend is not really here. You don't do that. This is, you know, we get conditioned to, to stop using it. So we never get to have that full functionality of that aperture of the feminine intuition. And we become more mind over matter in this linear perspective. But Mary Magdalene brings in that ability to um, see beyond the veil. And, and she's known to say, you know, I will, what is hidden, I will reveal to you. You know, so all of the things that have been hidden from us, both with our own shadows and on a collective level, be, begin to, um, be shown and you could call it an apocalypse and we're living in a time of apocalypse which really just means revelation mm. just means cleaning that window or the veil of what we're habituated or conditioned to see and it can be frightening because people are going to think you're crazy if you start talking <laughs> about um, the unseen as an adult and I do that for yeah. a living yeah. so yeah. I'm so glad <laughs> Um, so glad. But, but that's the place of symbology and yeah. we, where we have a very direct communication with the universe. Yeah. And, um, and I'm going to share a story. I actually shared it at a recent book reading, but it's relevant. And, 
universe speaks to me through myth and story, mm -hmm. right? And I, and I love some of the biblical stuff because I think there's a lot of allegory and, and golden nuggets to, to be extracted. And this past summer, I went and visited a friend in Northern Vermont at Lake Eden. Mm -hmm. And her niece was there and she was seven and um, her, her, her niece is Eve. So I hung out with Eve at Lake Eden. I was like, okay, universe, I'm, I'm paying attention. I know you're showing me something. I don't know what, but, you know, with seven-year-olds, so they're like, let's go swimming. Yeah. They can't wait yeah. to get in the water. And so we, um, we went to the dock and we were going to swim across Lake Eden, which is pretty far without life jackets. In this seven-year-old, I was like, Okay, I'm CPR certified. Yeah. Thank God. She's if she drowns, go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> yeah. get her. Yeah. And we, we got in the water and we're about to swim across, and we swim out a little bit, and she says, "We're almost there." I was like, <laughs> "Okay, I'm not seeing what you're seeing, but I'm with you. <laughs> we're doing it." And so we're swimming, we're swimming, and then she says, "We're almost there." And I was like, all right, okay. I turn around and look at the dock. I'm like, we're not that far away. <laughs> and we're swimming. And this is like a mantra. This is like yeah. this, this is like a way that she sees that he, the, uh, the other dock is literally across the way. And although it's a far distance, she doesn't focus on how she's not going to make it and how she's going to drown. This, this con concept of fear is like not really active in her. Yeah. Um, it's active in me. I'm like, okay, I'm, I know I can save her if anything happens. And, and, and we're almost there. We're almost there. And we get there and then we hang out at the dock and she's like, we're here. <laughs> and then we, and then we swim back. And, and the next day I, I was working at the hospital and it was one of those busy, rough days. And, um, I felt really emotionally challenged. And, and then I thought to myself, we're almost there, you know, but it was more than just that day. It was, it was also about, the age that we're living in, this evolutionary shift. We're in the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, the Age of Aquarius. There are many, many, um, many descriptions about the time that we are living in, and but we are almost there. And the the archetype of Mary Magdalene is to be able to see a little bit of that. You know, mm. her claim to fame is finding a resurrected Christ. Mm. You know, in spirit form. And he said, do not cling to me. And, and that really means that we, we see through this intuitive um, facet or channel that we have through the third eye, but there's still an integration that needs to take place before we can truly embody it and use it as a way to communicate and express with other people to let them know we're, we're almost there, yeah. but, you, but there's something in you that sees through your own third eye that knows you have your own divine compass you relate to symbology or authors or current events mm -hmm. um, that are very unique to you and and trusting and trusting that and, uh, and allowing those insights to come through without putting you know the blinders down or the veil across mm -hmm. um, so you know mary magdalene um you know was thought to be, you know, a whore, and maybe she was. Who knows? Maybe she was. There's no, there, there's nothing wrong with sex <laughs> yeah. work, or, yeah. or if that's what you know is there, but, yeah. uh, or what you do. But um, she was living in a time where, you know, this Judeo-Christianity pa patriarchal, masculine as leader, masculine that sits at top mm -hmm. of a ladder that looks down over. Um, everything else and everyone else was in place and sh and she was revolutionary in showing that no that's not it there's there's more to it mm. there's more to it and so despite her condemnation through history she's she's remained an archetypal figure for feminine intuition and spirituality to have new eyes in a way you know yeah yeah I through my own journey as a poet and musician and dancer, which growing up I did a little of, uh, started playing guitar more recently. This was the year, for some reason, that I started saying to myself, I need to perform more, I need to share my music and my fear more, work through that fear to see that I, even if there's fear, even if there's negative or positive feedback like this is the 
what I'm seeing to be my truth to share and give this gift that I was born with and and to not be held back by that shadow, but to recognize the potential for creativity and, and to see that bridge between the creative life force and my own truth, mm -hmm. which is music and song and dance. And you talk a little bit, of, talk about ecstatic and bliss. And that for me is found, and maybe through you too, through dance and, mm -hmm. Um, and music and you're also a musician yes yeah and I can't wait to play with you <laughs> <sometime> <laughs> when we get that opportunity um, yeah can you share and you know I don't hear a lot about your relationship to music or singing in the book but I'm mm -hmm. curious how um, we can relate this back to the to the throat chakra which you also talk about here um, and I all just, just a little um, anecdote I want to give whoever might watch this, a, a brief description of what the chakras are. So maybe you could touch on that, and yeah. then I'd love to hear about your, how music and song comes into this spiritual journey as well. Sure, the, the chakras are like a ladder to illumination. Mm. So they start very <laughs> dense, and there's seven of them. I mean, there are more, but uh, most, widely used understanding of chakra, at least in the West, is through the seven chakras. And they start dense and they get lighter and lighter as it um, as as you go up. And so the first chakra is the element of earth, it's muladhara, it's root. And we have lost our connection to the root chakra. Mm. And you can see that in our connection to our planet mm. and also each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with roots, there's this, there's a, a system of communication that's subtle, but there, and it's based on harmony. That's our nature too. And we've been corrupted, so we've lost our, our connection to that. So that's, it's also a feminine element. And then there's the water element, Svadhisana. Second chakra, creativity, fertility, relationships. And then there's the third chakra, which is fire or spirituality. And that is the burning area where our energy kind of moves up into the heart. And we need that fire energy to get into the heart because the heart is often the challenge, most challenging energetic center because our hearts are so guarded that um, we need to break our hearts open in order to, they need to break to break mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. in order to connect it, which is a lot of what's happening for many people on the spiritual journey right now mm -hmm. is that heartbreak, yeah. just as much as creating music and poetry is also part of that. And, the, yeah. and music connects us to, or for me, writing music and poetry connects me to the heartbreak in a soft way. Yeah. And so, I mean, of course, life gives you what it gives you, whether it's death of a loved one or relationship changed or loneliness. I mean, there's many things that can cause that heartbreak, but that's where m many of us are at now. And then it moves up into Vishuddha, which is the throat chakra, and then Ajna, the third eye. And these are what's above the heart. These three chakras above the heart are more social. So that's how we express and share what we have connected to in the mm. lower chakras. And then the crown chakra is when our shakti or feminine energy is fully opened, we become vessels or channels for heaven and earth, literally through our own body. Thank you. I, I wanna, you Ray, share this quote, that the nature of the heart is equality and coherence. When we overemphasize life's mental and linear aspects, which we've talked a little bit about, we inadvertently minimize love and compassion and become out of balance and cut off from our humanity. If we have lost our connection to love, which many of us have, the heart needs to break open and regain its function as the bridge of vitality it was created for. And I, I find so much resonance in this, and as much as we wanna avoid grief and avoid fear and avoid loss, uh, especially as we can relate as individuals, but to our social systems that are are falling apart through climate change, through genocide, through racism and oppression, all these ways that we've cut ourselves off from our humanity. Um, hearing you talk about the way that we can root through this through this way of being um, with our root chakra and and the 
symbolism of how it's connected to the earth and how we're connected to our creativity and our hearts. And we need all of those elements and we need our gifts to be, to share with each other. And I, you know, I've spent a long time like, oh, like, I don't really want to share or I feel afraid to share or um, kind of just getting in my own way. And I think that's really relatable to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I, um, hearing you talk about really being in our power is so much about what this book is about. Um, and, you know, we can talk a lot about all of all of these words, but really, like, what can we do what are some practical ways that we can tap into our power without putting too much pressure on ourselves to perfect it because mm -hmm. i think that's that's a challenge in our culture too mm -hmm. the a white supremacy culture that says mm -hmm. that we have to be perfect okay so becoming our full authentic selves could become an object of perfectionism mm -hmm. so ha what are the things that we can do to help us tap into this wisdom without it maybe going into that shadow side of like, I must be perfect, I mm -hmm. must be whole. I'm, you know, the, do you know, you know what I mean by that? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, Anis Nin says, uh, in chaos there is fertility. Mm. So we have to be willing to get messy. <laughs> and orgasm is as messy as it gets <laughs> in my book. I feel like that's that point where be openness for things to, to go a way that you don't expect, you know, and that means uh, l lessening control. Mm. And, and we're getting it now, whether whether you try or not, everybody's getting this <laughs> challenge. And it's just about being present. And, and for me, nature is, is just a grounding force for me. And I find that's my go to to reconnect with myself and ground um, when things get challenging because they will. Um, and that chaos is all that juicy stuff, but it's also very messy and very uncomfortable at times, like excruciatingly uncomfortable and having, and having relationships that are transparent, authentic and deep are very important. And I find that the, the more transparent my relationships are, they're the ones where I can go really deep with grief or yeah. anger, yeah. but also like pee your pants kind of joy. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, oh, I'm so glad to have some of those. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. part of that, you know, c connection to power is activating the blockages mm. that have stopped us from from really feeling it and control is one of those ways. Like, mm. you know, perfectionism and control will keep everything locked down. But when things get messy, they start to they start to move and people situations you could you could look at the election right now all of those ways get us excited or polarized or traumatized or triggered mm. to kind of like put a little tremble in the armor so that something has the capacity to open mm. um, and it happens i find with without attachment and that's the hardest thing is we want to take ourselves our beliefs our families personally uh -huh. and life at this buddha nature level is not personal mm. that's the illusion that we get is that it's personal which is fun <laughs> but <laughs> yes because it's a dopamine hit to be in conflict too and be attached so it's like God, there's some fun in that attachment there is there is conflict and i think when when you talk about attachment, what is what does that mean for you? And how can you know? I practice little like non-attachment through getting rid of things or allowing there to be space if a relationship isn't going the way that I thought it might or expect it would. Just giving a little bit of space. But how can we work towards practicing non-attachment when it's so much a part of our culture to be and cling and have? I think to just be with it and mm -hmm. most attachment comes um, from a desire f to have things be our way and when they don't go our way there's this inner child that <laughs> gets pissed off mm -hmm. judgment <laughs> criticism anger genocide mm. all come from this place of attachment mm -hmm. and so when you let go of attachment even to the way that 
spirit or holiness or divine expresses, then you become one with everything. Mm -hmm. And to be one with everything is to love the bully as much as the bullied. Mm -hmm. And that is where, when we release attachment, the compassion is, is um, for me, that level of compassion is so painful, my human body can hardly stand it. <laughs> But that's where we're going. Mm -hmm. It just is. When we move beyond our, uh, our need to judge or criticize or control or be angry, when we stop defending, mm. then, we're, then we're impacting the world. Mm. Then we're like rubbing up a, against it in, in fun ways, in ways that aren't harmful to both ourselves and, and others. We're willing to flow. Yeah. Back to Lilith, you know, that's, you know, when I write about the second chakra in the book, the, the essence of it is flow. You know, and f and flow also means that there are phases and stages, mm. and we don't we don't get to control which one we're in, mm. or anyone else, and that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's 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 the yogic principle of ahimsa or nonviolence, and I think as I relate to my path of full expression and and non-attachment or you know whatever my spiritual journey may be because it feels I feel like it changes even day mm -hmm. to day um, that that's what I hold true first and foremost is am I being violent towards myself and judgment and criticism that inner child which I will listen to and then ask it is this harmful to myself and is it harmful to others and I think that for me, that's almost, that's the, the kind of the easiest concept for me to grasp mm. onto as I relate to my community, as I relate to, to what, I, what I take action towards in regards to climate change or social action um, or how I vote, <laughs> is it harmful to myself and others? And um, I think that there's, there's so much practical, down-to-earth wisdom with what you share as well as bringing in the esoteric, the, the meta, the cosmic here on, to be recognized as, as also potent, as potent as the practical grounded application. Because you also work in the medical field, yes. in the system of medicine, yeah. and bring in your energy healing and Reiki into that world and um, we'll have to wrap up here soon. But um, we've talked a lot about how this individual transformation can fit into the context of the times that we are living in and, um, and how this journey can impact others. I, I have been impacted by you just when we had conversation that you we had in our in my living room and seeing this model for someone that can really truly live in their authenticity and is sharing it with love even if I might not want to hear it <laughs> but that 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 my journey to full expression claiming my sexuality my heart my Mary Magdalene essence um regardless of how I identify in my gendered body, mm -hmm. uh, is so potent. So what do you really want people to take away from this book? And then I would love to share with folks how they can get a copy of this book and if you might have any other readings coming up um, and um, any other last words you'd like to share. It's all here. <laughs> it's all now. You cannot miss it. You cannot miss it. Yeah. And it's okay for it to be messy. Mm. Um, the, my book is, I have it in a few local Vermont bookstores. Uh, which I'd love to mention because it helps to support the community and also Vermont authors. Mm -hmm. uh, Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Vermont uh, has the book, as well as Bear Pond Books in Stowe, Vermont, and Flying Pig Books in Shelburne, Vermont. It is also available on Ama Amazon. 
uh, for international um, buyers. Beautiful. And yeah, thank you so much. I just, I also, I'd asked about the cover yes. art and I'm curious if you could share briefly about where this came from. Um, yep, that I, I and my partner worked on that with AI. So it's like, I feel like the book brings ancient wisdom and also the evolutionary future, which I feel AI is a part of and how do we interact with that? So that came out between my partner and I and that. Beautiful, thank you so much. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to chat with Melody Joy and yeah, please go to her website, MelodyMysticJoy.com if you'd like to work with her more. Um, it's been an honor. Thank you, <laughs> likewise.